This is Twit. Uh, believe it or not, we have the vulnerability that keeps on giving uh, with Spectre. Researchers from the University of California at Riverside have published a paper de detailing yet another brand new attack that affects Intel, AMD, and ARM speculative execution, which, get this, bypasses all existent, existing recent software and firmware mitigations against speculation execution attacks. That is, this is a new type of attack on speculative execution, which none of the stuff we've done this year uh, fixes. Um, and it, because Ugh. it, I, I know, it uses an, an entirely different mechanism in all modern architectures than what we've been focusing on, which is caching and branch prediction. It uses something known as the return stack buffer. So consequently, this is named Spectre RSB. Now, okay, uh, in podcasts for the last nearly 12 years, we've often talked about the stack. It's been a, it's been a, a mixed blessing for, for especially for security people because it is in buffer overruns that the stack is often uh, uh, is it, it, often participating, and it's because the stack has traditionally been in executable memory that if you loaded a buffer that was as as the phrase is on the stack and could somehow arrange to get program execution to jump into the stack, that is, into the buffer that you had provided, and it was executable, you could run the code that you had remotely supplied. So we have a remote code execution situation. L more recently, because the stack is normally meant to store data and really doesn't it isn't needed to store code. We've uh, the um, updates to architectures have marked the stack NX non-executable. Um, so these problems have have largely gone away. In the early days of Windows, it was interesting. the 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 movement of bits on the screen, the so-called bit blit operations, where you would move a rectangle, on the screen, you know, as like as part of as part of the windowing operations in the very early days, before we had GPUs, that Windows would actually write code to perform that operation on the stack and deliberately execute it. So it was there a big was mass copy of data from one memory location to another, right? Right, right. But you didn't. But they they didn't want to have. I mean, they were so concerned about performance that they couldn't use general purpose algorithms with lots of if tests and loop counts and things because doing that would slow it down too much. So so like to do the operation, they would actually build the code on the fly, stick it on the stack, and run it there in order to get the absolute maximum performance from this particular operation. So, and of course, those days are long gone, but st executable stack remained and has now finally disappeared because it was just such, such, such a security problem. But the way the stack works is it's a sort of a general purpose scratch pad. So, and it, it comes into main use in two instances. When you... When you're in some code and you want to jump to, you want to execute a subroutine that is a, a block of code that performs some function, you normally do that by pushing the parameters for that function onto the stack. So you you have some some values and you 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 push them on the stack. You then you then jump to that at to a, a certain location as a subroutine. And what that means is that at, at the end, that subroutine 
needs to come back to where to, to the instruction after it was called so that the jumping to a subroutine, what the processor does is it puts the return address on the stack. It pushes, so you first push the parameters to be used. Then as you jump to the subroutine, the instruction, the address of the instruction after that jump is pushed on the stack so that so that when the subroutine is finished executing, it knows how to get back to where it was called from. So the stack has a combination of parameters and return addresses. And inside the subroutine, it might need some like some scratch pad area. Some it might it might need what are normally called local variables. So it's able to use the stack itself. It'll it'll allocate some memory on the stack to contain the its own little working memory area and the, they're they're local because they don't need to be retained after the subroutine executes so it's perfect to put them on the stack cuz they just get popped off the stack and they they sort of disappear so so all of this works but in thinking through like every possible way to make that process faster where you know the in, the intel engineers and in general processor engineers were like okay you know how where where else can we squeeze out a little more performance they said hey rather than having this software stack which mixes all this other stuff let's have a separate hardware stack where we where we don't store the parameter, the calling parameters, and we don't store local values. We it's only for the return addresses. Thus, it's called the return stack buffer, and it's in hardware. It exists. It's not very deep. That is, the buffer itself is like typically between four and sixteen entries or return addresses deep. So, and it doesn't have to be very deep because maybe you're only going to a subroutine and then coming back, which you only need one memory. Or if that subroutine calls another subroutine, which then returns to the first subroutine and the first one comes back to where it came from, that would require two and so forth. But so it doesn't need to be very deep because it normally gets reused a lot. But what this allows is when you're speculating and you are you're wanting your processor to run ahead. I mean, that's after all, that's what this whole thing is, is it's prefetching instructions that may be executed and and like get it's like doing as much work ahead of time as it can so that it to, to keep the system as busy as possible. So when it's when the system is speculating and it hits a, a return address, that it, I'm sorry, it hits a return instruction, it knows when the processor actually gets around to doing that, it's going to be doing a return from the stack. But between then and now, the stack may go through a whole bunch of other things. So it, the point is it the, the speculator can't use the value on the actual software stack because it may be changed by the top, by like from popping some other stuff off of it before the processor actually gets to the return instruction. Yet the speculator, which is wanting to run ahead of that, needs to know where to return to. So that's where the return stack buffer comes in. Since the return stack buffer only contains return addresses, the the speculator can know with high confidence that when that return instruction is eventually executed, even if the software stack is pushed and popped and all kinds of things happen to it in the meantime, that return instruction will be taking it back to the location on the return stack buffer. So the point is that by the time the processor actually gets ready to do the return, the return stack buffer and the actual physical stack will be synchronized. But this processor can't wait for that because it wants to run ahead. So the return stack buffer 
provides sort of a pure, simplified mini stack that allows speculation. And not surprisingly, that can be leveraged. And that's what these UC Riverside guys have done. Um, they, they, the, and it turns out it is a potent attack. They said in this paper, we introduce a new attack vector, specter like attacks that are not prevented by deployed defenses, meaning nothing we've done so far this year helps. Because again, this is a di completely different orthogonal from all of the other speculating systems vulnerability. They said specifically, the attacks exploit the return stack buffer, RSB, to cause speculative execution of the payload gadget that reads and exposes sensitive information. The RSB, and then they explain it as a processor structure used to predict return addresses by pushing the return address from a call instruction on an internal hardware stack, they say typically of size 16 entries. When the return is encountered, the processor uses the top of the RSB to predict the return address to support speculation with very high accuracy. We show that the RSB can be easily manipulated by user code. They say a call instruction causes a value to be pushed to the RSB, but the stack can be subsequently manipulated by the user so that the return address no longer matches the RSB. That is, they can cause, they can, it's easy to cause a deliberate mismatch, which can then be detected because that will change timing. They said, we described the behavior of RSB in more detail, showing an RSB-based attack that accomplishes the equivalent of Spectre Variant 1 through manipulation of the RSB instead of, of mistraining the branch predictor, which of course was all about what the first variant of Spectre was, was doing at the beginning of the year. We use this scenario to explain the principles of the attack. Anyway, what I, what I liked about this, oh, and by the way, this also cuts through Intel's highest level of protection known as the SGX, the, uh, the software guard extensions, they demonstrate an attack on, a successful attack on Intel's software guard extensions, which is Intel's secure enclave technology, just rendering it useless. Um, they said current system, they, they finish saying current systems are fundamentally insecure unless speculation is disabled. However, we believe that it is possible to design future generations of CPUs that retain speculation, but also close speculative leakage channels, for example, by keeping speculative data in separate CPU structures than committed data. And, you know, this is, this is as I've been saying, this is, this repeats the feeling that I've had as we've developed over the last seven months a more mature understanding of just how bad this is. I mean, you know, where, as I was talking about last week, maybe we end up having to just segregate processes on processors and not allow the, the, the you know, the fully free cross hardware usage of threads and processors and VMs and all, because there's just speculation is, is too important. We can't turn it off or performance will c collapse. Um, yet we can't have it on where the, where threads are altering the processors are, are altering the processors future as a consequence of its past, which is what speculation leverage does for us. So, I mean, we've really painted ourselves into a box until until we rethink how to do all this.